Hi and welcome. We're now into chapter 8. This is the feeding and eating disorders and sleeping and wake disorders. Now I'm going to do these in two separate videos. Just so you know, I'll do the feeding eating in one video and sleeping and wake disorders in another. Isn't it surprising that in Canada, a country of plenty, that some people would starve themselves, even starving themselves to death? In these more modern times with the proliferation of advertising, movies, internet, social media, images of desirability and the ability to communicate and comment on one another's images has facilitated the struggle some people have with weight and wanting most notably to be thinner. Some dysfunctional and unhealthy choices are exercised, uh, binging and purging, Extreme maladaptive eating patterns are the focus of the first part of chapter 8. Now, eating disorders like bulimia and nervosa, uh, bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa have often affected people of high school and college age, especially young women. These disorders are on the rise in Canada. Now, consider Beth. At first, she's eating too much um, and would just go to the washroom and make herself sick. Uh, she was not aware of bulimia, but she was beginning to eat based on how she felt about herself. When her hair looked bad, she would eat loads of candy. And after a while, Beth started exercising excessively because she felt so guilty about eating. She'd run for miles and miles and go to the gym for three to four hours a day. And I'm sure you can see the risks that Beth was putting into her life. Now we're going to explore feeding and eating disorders We'll go through the descriptions, theoretical perspectives, and treatments first in part one. Wake sleep, uh, sorry, sleep wake disorders, descriptions, the theoretical perspectives, and treatment are going to follow in part two. So let's begin with feeding and eating disorders. Feeding and eating disorders are psychological disorders involving disturbed eating patterns and maladaptive ways of controlling body weight. And we're going to begin with anorexic nervosa. Now this is an eating disorder primarily affecting young women. It does not exclude itself of men. It's just most predominantly experienced by women. And it's characterized by maintenance of an abnormally low body weight. Distortions of body image and intense um, fears of gaining weight. The risk in females is um, amnorrhea or the absence of menstruation. And another risk is osteoporosis or calcium deficiency resulting in brittle bones. Now, this can be a huge issue. I'm sure most of us have probably had some awareness of anorexic nervosa. But until you've actually seen somebody who's close to you as a family member, my sister uh, experienced a few years of anorexic nervosa. She's five foot ten and weighed eighty four pounds at her lowest weight. She wouldn't see herself as overly skinny when she looked in the mirror. In fact, she was quite alarmed at what she thought were still fat on her that she needed to um, uh, get rid of. Now, when we talk about anorexic uh, nervosa, there's two types. There's the binge eating purging type, utilized to lose weight, but, un but unlike bulimia, the person maintains their weight. And then the second type, sorry, the second type um, is restrictive type, obsessive, light control over their diet and appearance. They will restrict what they eat maybe a soda biscuit per day, you know, and a half a glass of water or something to that effect. It's really quite um, alarming. Now, bulimia nervosa. This is an eating disorder characterized by a reoccurrent pattern of binging followed by an inappropriate compensatory behavior such as purging eaten food. Now, this is either through vomiting or through the use of laxatives. To prevent weight gain, it is accompanied by persistent over concern with body weight and shape. Now, these sound like, and like I mentioned in the introduction, you know, we're an affluent society, so the idea that food becomes an issue in some respects seems counterintuitive. 
and yet these are psychological issues these are not physical insofar as the physical doesn't present and then the psychological follows the psychological presents and then the physical follows now binging now, like a lot of things, we probably get a grasp on what binging is. People with bulimia nervosa may uh, cram, cram thousands of calories during a single binge and then attempt to purge what they have consumed by forcing themselves to vomit. The medical complications of bulimia, repeated stomach acids being uh, that are you know, running through the esophagus from repeated vomiting can cause skin irritations, blockages of salad, salivary ducts, decay of tooth enamel, and dental cavities. Uh, pancrea, uh, pancrea, uh, uh, titis. this is the inflammation of the pancreas. Uh, abdominal pains uh, from uh, these cycles of eating and binging. P potassium deficiency, producing muscular weakness, cardiac irregularities, and even to the extreme of sudden death. Now, the causes for anorexia and bulimia, well, it involves a very complex interplay of a host of biopsychosocial. Bio now, listen to that term there, biopsychosocial factors. So there's a biological component, a psychological component, and a sociological component. Increasingly, researchers are finding that eating disorders arise when underlying genetic and neurobiological vulnerabilities interact with the social pressures felt by young people that lead them to put a high value on their physical appearance, especially their weight. The socio-cultural kind of perspective is that eating disorders appeared more frequently in North America. Social expectations for women, and even men, to match with the unrealistic standard. Now, I don't know if you remember this, uh, but they sort of, um, researchers had sort of looked at what would a human body need to look at look like with some of the social expectations and and representations that exist in society today and i think they used the barbie doll and said what were the actual measurements of what the barbie doll in a small toy would be if it were a full human being and it was something outrageous that you'd never see a human look like this and that whole notion around in some cultures there's a very high premium being put to Everyone must look in a particular way, and for some people, that's just unattainable, and the only way to try to attain is in very unhealthy ways. Now, for the sort of psychosocial perspective, here the considerations are focused on what people might be thinking and focusing on, in this case, their weight and their body dissatisfaction, which can lead to more extreme concerns for one's body and weight. Now, women suffering bulimia tend to be shy and have more psychological concerns and a lower self-esteem than other dieters. Now, you can also include in this family. Eating disorders and family conflict can coexist. So whether eating, uh, an eating disorder means, uh, is a means of exerting control over punishing or punishing parents. So in some people's instance, the family dynamics can influence one's I mean the one thing that we can control is what we put into our body and so if we feel like we're not very very much in control in our life whether that's to do with family dynamics then the one way we can exert control in ourselves is to control what goes in or alternatively as a way of punishing our parents and that's the sort of element that gets included there now biological Neurotransmitter serotonin and other reward centers are considered important to understanding bulimia, especially the relationship between increasing serotonin and decreasing binging is promising. Now, other neurotransmitters and eating disorders are being further explored as the role of impulsivity. Now, if we consider treatment, Anorexic nervosa and bulimia nervosa, well, people with anorexia may be hospitalized, especially when weight loss is severe and body weight is falling rapidly. Close monitoring and regular feeding regimes are emphasized. However, these are often uh, met with great resistance. This sometimes results in forcing more mechanical, that is feeding tubes, or chemical restraints to support weight gain. 
The best outcomes result from treatment that involves psychotherapy combined with nutritional management and family interventions. Now, other therapies that benefit patients with eating disorders are cognitive analytic therapy, behavior therapy, and cognitive behavior therapy. Now, because, as the term suggests, cognitive behavior is looking at the way you think and the way you behave and developing strategies to work your way into a healthier outlook. Behavior therapy is really just looking at changing the behaviors, whereas cognitive analytic therapy is breaking down how we think that supports the inappropriate behavior of binging and eating and um, managing restrictive diets. So let's break that down a little bit. Cognitive analytic therapy aims at helping patients learn new approaches to their food and eating. Family therapy attempts to identify and resolve any family conflicts or parenting styles that, to assist the parent. The cognitive behavior management therapy is pairing um, the pairing of correcting uh, faulty thinking with almost phobia treatment strategies. Binge eating disorder is a separate disorder, it's also known as BED, is an eating disorder characterized by repeated episodes by which binging occurs but there's not the follow by purging. All right, so this has been a relatively quick overview of just what the sort of eating disorders at a psychological disorder level are. You'll find in your textbook some of the DSM-5 conditions by which being diagnosed need to have. Um, so this is the completion of a review of feeding and eating disorders. You'll find in part two video, we'll review sleep and wake disorders. I hope this has been helpful for you um, and good luck. And we'll see you in the part two sleep and waking disorders. Bye for now.